Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the chance to be here today uh, amongst such an illustrious panel. Uh, we have a great discussion ahead of us. Uh, Julian assigned us some pretty heavy lifting for the day, uh, which is speaking to the very small topic of uh, what makes a great education. Uh, but thankfully, we have an extraordinary worthy set of panelists who are more than up to the challenge. Um, I uh, work with an organization called Luminos Fund, and we provide a second chance to children who've been denied the chance to go to school by poverty or conflict. And one of the happiest parts of my job is that I have the chance to see truly great education in all sorts of unexpected corners of the globe. I was just in Ethiopia just two weeks ago uh, visiting with some of the teachers we work with and support there and happened to have the chance to sit in on a primary school class that was tackling the topic of teaching children to tell time. And to anyone in the room who has young children or perhaps teaches young children, you'll know or recall that learning to tell time is an exceptionally challenging task. One is five, two is 10, six is half, 12 is the whole. Nothing about this is really intuitive for young children. Now think about that teaching challenge in a context where children would have seen a digital clock perhaps a handful of times on someone's mobile phone and had probably never seen an analog clock before. And I thought, gosh, I know how hard it is actually to teach my own children to tell time. I wonder how this teacher is going to tackle this task here in this context. And what unfolded before me was an extraordinary array of different multifaceted teaching techniques for helping make a very abstract concept real for children who were encountering it perhaps for the first time. This teacher had a clock drawn out on the clay floor using pebbles to indicate the different hours of the clock. We were in a classroom without electricity. The source of light was a single window and a single door. The teacher proceeded to close the window and assign one child to open and close the door, small bits, have the rest of the class indicate what was morning, what was noon, what was night, by the amount of light coming in. Uh, she assigned a different time to every child in the room and had them self-organize from earliest to latest part of the day. She asked children to unpack some math questions. I started this task at nine o'clock. It took me a half hour. What time was it when I finished? By the end of the day, the children had wrestled with this quite challenging concept in about eight or nine different ways. And this sort of 360 degree approach to learning is exactly what enables the teachers that, that we support in Ethiopia, Liberia, and elsewhere to work with out of school children and enable them to cover the first three years of schooling in just one year. And so one of the most heartening and I think inspiring parts of my job is to realize that, that anywhere with literally any level of resource, uh, extraordinary teaching can unlock incredible things for children. And so I was thrilled uh, to be asked to um, chair this lovely panel and our very daunting topic. Uh, and so without further ado, um, I'm going to turn um, first to uh, my colleague, Professor Paul Ramchandani of the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. We'll next ask my colleague, Dr. Bo Stierna Thompson from the Lego Foundation. And finally, my colleague, Heather Saunders from the Global Partnership for Education, known affectionately in our space as GPE, <laughs> to, to speak to this task. Um, and. Uh, um, Paul, if you might, if you can get, get us started, break us in right at the top. <laughs> from your perspective, from your vantage point, what makes a great education? And, and please, if you might, just share one or two words about yourself and your work as context. Okay, I'm going to move to the podium. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Um, my name is Paul Ramchandani. I'm the Lego Professor of Play here in the Faculty of Education. Um, in the Faculty of Education up the road, sorry, we're in Jesus College. I'm also um, following on from this morning's earlier uh, talk, a bit of an interloper from medicine. So I'm, I spent most of my career in medicine, uh, working as a child psychiatrist, leading a research group um, in infant and child mental health. Um, and it's not so big a jump for me, moving from health to education, because particularly when we're dealing with very young children, the worlds of health and education, the worlds of cognitive development and socio-emotional development are so closely intertwined 
So it's very difficult when we're doing interventions to distinguish. Um, distinguish interventions to just do one thing or another. Most interventions that work very early in life tend to work on a variety of outcomes. And I think if we're trying to improve education, we can't just go for improving educational outcomes. We can't just go for improving educational outcomes alone. We have to think about improving the life chances of children more broadly to really get the best outcomes. Um, I work at PEDAL um, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen there. It's a research centre uh, for research on play in education, development and learning. So reflecting that span across different areas of child development. And following on from this morning as well, not only is research in education fundamental, but research in the role of play in education is fundamental. Not just to demonstrate where it works, but also to be clear about where the limits of it are so that we produce the best outcomes for children. Um, as M&M, I don't quote M&M very often, but as M&M almost said, children only get one shot and the opportunity only comes once in a lifetime. So we're talking about really fundamental questions here. The question is a huge one. It slightly frightened me when I heard about it. What makes for a great education? And I've kind of got two answers. One I'm not going to talk about very much, but I think fundamentally what makes for a great education is having great educators. And I hope that we'll pick up that theme through the day. But the other answer I have is that what makes great education is education going right from the start of life. We can't wait until children are in primary school. We have to get education and the opportunity for optimal development going right from the very beginning of life. This is the Milky Way. Um, <clears throat> it's one of my favorite pictures, partly because it's so beautiful, but also linking to child development and babies' development. There are approximately 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. The estimates go up and down. It's probably loads more than that, really. But 100 billion is quite a nice number because 100 billion is also the number of neurons or nerve cells in a baby's brain at around about the time of birth. Again, that number probably varies a bit. No one sat down and counted every single one of them. But if you think about that for a moment, in a baby's brain smaller than mine, as my hair goes, I look more like a baby's head, but if you imagine a head smaller than mine and 100 billion neurons inside at the time that a baby's born. And that's not just a static picture. That's a very dynamic set of processes going on. These neurons are each connecting with other neurons, forming the pathways that we need to learn. Those that get used, the pathways become stronger and stronger. Those that don't get used get cut away, have various processes that go on. And the, the rate of this change is staggering. The rate of just cutting away is estimated that around about the time that a baby's born, about 60,000 connections a second are cut away because they're not used anymore. Far more than that are formed every second. So we're talking about a staggering number of brain cells and a staggering number of connections being formed and broken down. And that's what we're looking at when we look at a baby. So it's not difficult from that to step forward to thinking about the amount of learning that goes on and the amount of opportunity for learning that goes on. I want to show you just um, a brief video thinking about um, play and the opportunities to learn very early in life. Um, I'd ask if you are tweeting, please don't take pictures of this video. This is from a study that I ran in Oxford and London, um, Oxford and Milton Keynes, sorry, a few years ago. Um, and the, the families consented for us to use the videos for teaching and, and presentation purposes, but obviously they don't particularly want their pictures shown all over the internet. So if you could refrain from taking pictures and tweeting. What I'd ask you to do just in the next minute or so is watch what's... Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was a test. ...with mums and dads where we can, or whoever the carers are. Though that level of engagement is important, even from three months of life and probably even before that, because the father's level of engagement predicts outcomes for children, predicts how that child will develop. And the children whose fathers in this study had fathers who were most engaged in that little interaction. We coded them blind. We had researchers coding those videos blind to any characteristics of the father. Predicts not only children's behavioral development over the first year or two of life, but also their cognitive development at the age of two. So a direct link between those two things. Now, obviously, development is very complex, and there are lots of other factors, but that, that association holds when you control for a range of those other factors. And cognitive development at two predicts cognitive development as we go through life. So you already see right from the start of life the opportunity 
for different directions of development through that little play interaction. I'm not trying to say it's all about the play, but the play gives you some real insights into what's going on. And it's not just about mums interacting with their children or dads interacting with their children. We also try and study when parents are together, both of them, and how the interaction goes between the two of them. We find, I'm not going to show you this video because of time, but this is the setup that we use um, in this particular study. And we're looking at various patterns. We're looking at playfulness in the parents, but we're also looking at the degree of cooperation, uh, the, the extent to which the parents cooperate within play. And that degree of cooperation that we see within the play also predicts pro-social outcomes in the children. So the, the, in some ways they may be, and this is, a, this is a speculation, but they may be using the model of their parents and how their parents play with them as their first model of how people get on. But it's certainly linked to pro-social behavior. So what we have is these early parent-child play interactions predicting cognitive development and socio-emotional development in the children. And both of those things are fundamental for how children get in, settle into school and are able to access education. So that's my answer as a starter to that particular question. What's, what makes for a great education? A great education is right from the start of life. And those educators aren't just the brilliant teachers that we have, although they're really important. They're also the parents and the carers that we have right from the get-go. I'm going to leave you with a little advert. This is, um, this is the Pedal Hub. It's a, a new internet resource that we've just launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're funded by the Lego Foundation, for which we're very grateful. Um, and what we're trying to build here is a resource of research and information around play and play and education and child development. It's a free open access resource. We're trying to pull together key research, but we're also trying to interpret that for teachers, for parents, for policymakers, and so on. Please, if you get a chance, do go and use it. Um, and do give us feedback on it, because we're trying to develop and grow it so it's useful for everybody. Thank you very much for your time and attention.